Good day, sir. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you so much for coming and uh, meeting with us. We um, would like to ask you a few questions about your career and your journey in the law and uh, let you share with us some, some of the insights that you've, you've come across along the way. Sure. If that's okay. Far away. Um, well, let me start from the beginning. Uh, Where did you go to law school and what led you to, to that law school and, and a career in the law? Well, I went to the University of Florida undergraduate school and law school. And when I went off to college, I was the first member of my family to go to college. And uh, frankly, the only one in my generation in my family to graduate from college. So it was a new experience for me. My family uh, didn't think in terms of college degrees and things of that nature. So I was fortunate to be able to go to college. Uh, and I thought I was going to be a history teacher. I majored in history. I really enjoyed history. And I felt I would get an advanced degree in history and be a teacher, maybe hopefully in college someplace uh, for the rest of my life. And as I got to be, I guess, uh, senior year, several of my fraternity brothers had gone to law school and were talking about it. And I started thinking about law school, what's that all about? Because I don't think I ever met a lawyer. I certainly didn't know any lawyers. Uh, and I started thinking about it and I thought, well, maybe I should think about going to law school. It might be a little more flexible than a history degree if I decided I didn't want to teach history. So I kind of backed into law school, so I can't say this is one of those burning desires I've had since I was a little child. It was something I just kind of serendipitously came into because some other of my peers kind of influenced me to go to law school. A great decision, but it wasn't one I really thought through too much. Where did that lead you after law school? I mean, what, what did you do when you came out? Did, that, did going to law school help frame some of the ideas what you want to do with the rest of your life? Well, it's one of the most important decisions I ever made to go to law school. And I say I did it somewhat through the back door, but in retrospect, it was a wonderful decision. I, uh, I love being a lawyer, and I love being a judge. I think uh, we have the best profession of all professions. The type of people who are drawn to be lawyers to the profession are the kind of people I like to associate with. In spite of all the lawyer jokes, uh, which are grossly exaggerated, I think unwarranted, even though some are kind of funny from time to time. I think the people who are drawn to the legal profession are the best of our society. They're the people who contribute to our society. They formed our country, basically, and they continue to be the people who are out in front and most of the most important decisions that are made in this country. And I was fortunate, like I say, to go to law school. I enjoyed law school quite a bit. Uh, after three years, I was ready to go on to the next step. I came back here to Miami. I was. Uh, trial lawyer. I uh, started with a firm called Freddy's Fay and Floyd. The Fay being uh, Peter T. Fay, who is now an 11th Circuit judge. And uh, I've been a trial lawyer. I had been a trial lawyer for almost 36 years before I went on the bench. And I, I have to say, uh, I've enjoyed every year of it. What, what drew you to trial work? Well, I don't know. It was just kind of one of those things that just seemed natural. Uh, I knew I didn't want to read uh, abstracts. Matter of fact, I interviewed with a firm and I told them that, that I was in a table that's about three or four times the size of this table and all the partners were sitting around and they said, well, what kind of law do you want to practice? And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, but I did say I didn't want to read abstracts. Well, I didn't do my research because that firm represented a savings and loan and they did a lot of abstract reading. <laughs> but what drew me to the trial practice, I guess, was the firm itself. It was a terrific group of, of men at that time, uh, some of the best trial lawyers in the state of Florida, in the country, Fraze, Fay, and Floyd were extremely well known, a small boutique firm. And so it was more the firm that drew me to be a trial lawyer than the idea I was going to be a trial lawyer. What, when you first started your job at that law firm, did, was there any type of uh, program in the firm to teach you how to become a trial lawyer, or did you get thrown into it, your first trial, and Maybe can you tell us your experience with your first trial? I'm smiling here because <laughs> my first trial was being thrown in. I remember it was a small case. Unlike lawyers today or young lawyers today, they don't have a chance to go to try cases very often. We have so few trials going on that the young lawyers are frustrated by not being able to try cases. As a matter of fact, I think it's the statistics are something like 2% of the cases, at least in the federal system, go to trial on the civil side and maybe 3% on the criminal side. So they're not a lot of opportunities. We, on the other hand, were given a file, shown the way to the courthouse, and went to try a case. And I remember my first case was tried before Judge Eaton, who it was a state court case at the time. He eventually went to the federal court. And it was quite an experience finding my way you know, as to what to do as a young lawyer. 
So we didn't have the formal training that you have. Uh, we didn't have the litigation skills programs that schools have. The University of Miami, University of Florida both have them. I know, I suspect most schools do. So it was kind of on the job training to a great extent. However, we had some great resources as well. Even though it wasn't formal, we had very good mentoring by the, the uh, partners in the firm who, uh, by their example and by their actually sitting down with us and teaching us, taught us how to be lawyers. I, I can think of uh, Bill Freites and then Pete Fay, uh, who were, even though they weren't designated as mentors, because I don't recall ever hearing the word mentor, mentee back then, uh, they were natural mentors. And we just kind of lapped it up. They were so good. Bill Freites was probably the best trial lawyer I've ever seen. Uh, matter of fact, I would make that statement. He was just excellent. He was very aggressive in the courtroom, uh, very, very competitive, and I think sometimes was described as a bulldog. Uh, he was extremely good, but he was always very, very professional. And he always tried to instill in us those same feelings about lawyers. He took great pride in being a lawyer. And he was so proud. He loved the profession. He was really, really a very interesting man. And even with all of his competitiveness and his aggressiveness, he always treated the other side with a great deal of respect. And I can remem remember uh, one of the trials that we tried together. Well, actually, we didn't try it together. He tried it. I carried his briefcase and handed him documents. But I remember an incident that I'll never forget. Um, I was in charge of all the pretrial things, and the defense counsel had called a witness. And I knew this witness had not been listed on the witness list. And I leaned over to Mr. Freites. I said, Mr. Freites, we should object. This witness was not listed on the defendant's witness list. And we can keep him out. Because at that time, the order said, if they weren't listed on the list, that they couldn't use the witness. And Mr. Freites turned to me and said, Paul, we're not going to object. Said, that was an honest mistake, omission. We're going to let him testify. And he said to me something I'll never forget. I said, Paul, someday that could be you or me making that same mistake. I've never forgotten that lesson. It's also interesting that the person, the person who was on the other side who made that mistake was a person with a very good reputation, and they had tried cases against each other for a long time. And I'm sure Mr. Freites knew and understood that this lawyer was not someone who would sandbag somebody by trying to bring in somebody, uh, you no, know, deliberately not listing his name, but rather made an honest mistake. Which is another lesson, I think, that uh, you know, your reputation kind of precedes you and it, it affects the way people and lawyers look at you as another lawyer. And that's one example of that particular mentor to you uh, being professional, um, not objecting to the other lawyer's calling of the witness. But you said that that... Let me interrupt you there, though. Bill Freddy's was a good enough lawyer to know that he was going to do a pretty good job on cross-examination, and he cross-examined pretty well. And I think at the, at the end of the day, he probably came out ahead. And that, that sort of ties in. Um, what other... How, how would you describe to young lawyers today how you can be aggressive and a tough trial lawyer and advocate, yet, can, yet be professional? What other ways uh, can you do that? Well, let me say this first. You don't have to be aggressive per se. Mm -hmm. you, you need to represent your client as vigorously as you can, obviously within the confounds of both the ethics and the professional responsibility standards. But not everybody's a Bill Freites. Peter Fay, on the other hand, who is an excellent mentor, but in a different way, a different personality. Great trial lawyer, but he was a kinder, gentler trial lawyer. And he was the type of person who people wanted to help wanted to do good things for, who ingratiated himself with people, and, and he was just effective that way. Um, and as a mentor, in some ways he was more effective in the sense that he actually sat us down and mentored us. Uh, I re recall that the four or five of us young lawyers would go out to his house on Wednesday evenings, sit in his Florida room on the sofa there, and he would sit there and tell us how to be a trial lawyer. He would tell us how to dress, Never more than two suits in a week of trial. Not that any of us had more than two suits to, to wear. He would tell us how to treat the judge, how to cross-examine, how to treat the, the uh, staff of the court, how to treat the, the lawyers on the other side, how to treat the witnesses, how to prepare the case. But he always told us to take the high road. And this, I'm not saying this just because we're, we're filming this right now. This is exactly the way he taught us. He said, always take the high road. It's the right thing to do. 
It's also the most effective way to be a good advocate. And you feel better about yourself. And I've never forgotten those lessons. And we would sit there, and he would just teach us how to be a trial lawyer. It was just a wonderful experience. And even almost 50 years later, those of us who had gone through that experience with uh, now Judge Fay, always talk about him and what a great experience. That was the best CLE we ever got. Was in that sitting on the couch in Judge Fay's floor room, or Mr. Fay's floor room. I'm, I'm curious, why only two suits? Well, we didn't get paid as much as lawyers get paid today. So I, I think I had two suits. Mm -hmm. I had a blue suit, dark blue suit, and I think I had a uh, khaki suit, colored suit. But, but his but advice? His advice was, you don't want to show the jury that you are wealthy or you're, you're better than the jury. Because he was always explaining who the jurors are. You've got to treat jurors with respect and let them get to know you and to like you. And he felt that by coming out there with uh, fancy watches and lots of uh, glittery, and, you know, uh, jewelry and, and you know, a new suit every day with a fancy tie would not be the way to sell your case or your story to the jury. And that's what it's all about, is telling your version of the story to the jury so they can, one, understand it, and two, accept it being a credible story. That was just one of his, uh, his ideas. I think he was right. So you started a, a lengthy career in litigation, and would you say that that was a rewarding career, a rewarding practice for you? Absolutely. I, I, I can't say I loved every day of it, but there are very few exceptions. It's a, I think it's a great career. Very, very tough. It's not easy. Uh, being a trial lawyer is a very demanding job, but the rewards are great. I, I, I found it exciting, uh, very interesting. I got to work with great people. Uh, dealing with experts, uh, cross-examination, the challenge of, of uh, you know, winning your case in the right way, challenging the expert, becoming a mini-expert so you could be able to cross-examine an expert. These are all great challenges, and if you're the kind of person who wants these kind of challenges and gets satisfaction from trial work is, is really the way to go, I think. Did you, let me ask you on a personal level, when you were practicing as a trial lawyer, can you describe kind of the day in the life of a trial lawyer at the time? What time would you get started in the morning? What well, time would you end the day? Well, I don't want to discourage those people who are going to see this film, but the hours are long. Mm -hmm. But it, it didn't seem like they were long because you were enjoying what you were doing. And uh, say when I first started practicing, we had a bunch of young lawyers. We all were in the same thing together. Uh, we had a lot of camaraderie. We helped each other. It, was, uh, it wasn't competition among us. It was all help the others and, and all trying to get better at what we were doing at our profession, our jobs. And uh, so we worked long, long hard hours. Uh, we had, even though Bill Freites was a great mentor, he was extremely demanding in the sense that he wanted the best of us and he would not accept anything less than the best work we could do. And sometimes... Sometimes we would get embarrassed. Sometimes it would be you know, a very trying day when he would put you under cross-examination as to what did you do, what didn't you do, because he was always trying to say, you can do better than this. I'm not going to accept anything less than your best work. And that was also instilled in all of us. And we carry that, I think, all of those young lawyers from that day who are now old lawyers like me, uh, we still carry that with us, not to accept anything less than what you can do at the best. How do you balance those long hours and that hard work ethic with a family life? Well, I have to admit, I wasn't the best balancer of that. I was one of those uh, compulsive uh, workaholics. Uh, in retrospect, I kind of wish I hadn't given up some of the hours I should have spent with my family. Uh, that's, I think of all the regrets, that's the only regret I have about that. You don't get those hours back. Let me tell you what I, this is one of those things I say, do as I tell you, not what I did. Mm -hmm. When I talk to young lawyers, uh, either law clerks or I speak at a lot of luncheons and, and visit law schools, I give them different pieces of advice. I think the best piece of advice I can give them is to do a self-evaluation of yourself. Take a personal inventory. What makes you tick? What makes you happy? What is going to satisfy you? And we're all different. And different things are going to make us happy. Some of us are going to want to be on the fast track. We want to be a partner as soon as possible. We want to make a lot of money. We want to have our names in the paper. We want to have the biggest house on the block. We want to have the biggest car, all those kind of things. And we're willing to spend the hours it takes in their long hours at the office in order to get that. And that's fine for that person. That's going to be what that person wants. 
another person and say, oh, well, no, I don't want to spend all my time down at the office. I want to have some time to play soccer with my kids, more time with my family, my wife. I want to be able to play tennis, you know, have some time just to relax. That's fine. But you have to realize that you've got to make those kinds of self-evaluations and then make your decision based on that. Uh, too often, you see, particularly in my generation, we didn't, we didn't do the self-introspection, I guess it is. And sometimes we just went along with the flow, which is kind of the way I was, but I was fortunate that I went along with the right flow just almost serendipitously. Um, but you've got to be careful. I, I was speaking with a lawyer some months ago, much younger than I am. I guess he's probably in his early 60s. And I saw him, he was walking across the parking lot, and I just said, Hi, how are you doing? He said, I'm fine. He said, I'm about to retire. And I said, so-and-so, how could you retire? You're so young. He said, I'm just ready to retire. I just have never enjoyed the practice of law. I thought to myself, God, what a shame. Because I've enjoyed the practice of law. I, I thoroughly enjoyed, you know, my, I'm almost 50 years now, practicing law and being on the bench. And here was somebody who said what he'd been doing, what his life was all about for maybe 25, 30 years, was something he didn't enjoy. And you cannot be a good lawyer, in my humble opinion, if you don't really enjoy going to work every day doing what lawyers do. But anyway, I think it's important to make that self-evaluation because you're going to have choices and you're going to make sure you make the right choice, the informed choice, and that is after you decide what it is that you really want in life. Don't just go along with the flow because someone else does something. Do you think that an attorney, a younger attorney now that's practicing that does want to have a balanced life with family and other and, and the practice, can, can they do it? Absolutely yes. And the reason I say the yes is because I've seen it. Uh, let me give you an example. The firm I was with before I went on the bench. Uh, we had a partner. Well, actually, she wasn't a partner at the time. She was an associate at the time, pregnant. She went on maternity leave. She was made a partner while she was on maternity leave. She came back. She was able to balance her life in the office with her life at home. A wonderful mother and a wonderful lawyer. She was able, and the firm acknowledged her worth to the firm, and we were willing to make, and I don't want to say they're compromised, we were willing to accommodate her to the extent that if she wanted to be at home with her child, great, we're, we're going to do whatever it took for her to be able to do that and balance that. And I think firms are more sensitive to that today, some more than others, but I think there's an awareness that there's more to life, and for a lot of people, uh, than just being at the office eight or ten hours a day. So I think it can be done. What do you think are some of the things that, as a profession, we need to be doing to instill some of those values? Is there anything we can be doing as a profession to help uh, bring young lawyers along like that? Well, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me there uh, to bring along like that you're talking about the situation of balancing exactly how can you what can we do to to make the profession better to allow for that sort of a balance to exist well first of all i don't think the people coming up need to be educated in that regard because they're already aware they're very knowledgeable about that there is a, a need to balance that life i see this more and more and i think they're right in that regard i really do uh, some of us older lawyers and judges have to realize that there are other things in life that people hold in high value. Their free time, their family, this and the other. So I think we need to educate the older lawyers to understand that a person can you know, be very, very uh, valuable to the firm, even though the person is working part-time or has other obligations with the family, things of that nature. So I think it's more educating the law firms, the senior partners in the firm to understand that maybe they grew up through the profession one way, but that's not the only way, and maybe not even the, the better way to go through it. So I think that's where the education has to come in. The young lawyers, they pretty, the ones coming out of law school are very savvy. They thought these things through for the most part, at least in my experience. And you've been involved in teaching at some law schools over the years, have you not? Yes. I've taught at the University of Miami uh, in the litigation skills program for 26 years. Uh, two years ago, I taught professional responsibility with my son, which was quite a treat. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I'm very involved with the University of Florida on the board up there. And I, matter of fact, I just came back um, three days there in classes and meeting with the students, having every meal uh, for three days with them and at night on the, what they call the Peter T. Fay Juris and Residence Program, a program we started some years ago uh, and, and under the name of Peter T. Fay, who right. is one of my 
not only my mentors, but a, a, a hero of mine. What have you seen change in, in legal education since you started teaching? I think it's improved. Uh, 50 years ago, this spring, I would have started as a freshman at the University of Florida Law School. It's been a sea change in the way they've approached education. Uh, the biggest change probably is the practical aspects. I think now, and particularly in the last decade or so, there's been an emphasis on teaching law students how to practice law, not just the academics. Now, I don't mean to undermine the importance of the academia, because that, that law school is the only place you're going to be able to immerse yourself purely in, in the academics. And that's very important to get that foundation. But more and more, I see law firms, governments, businesses, judges are looking for law students who come out of law school ready to hit the ground running, ready to actually practice law. And so we have clinics, litigation skills programs, things of that nature, actually practicing law. And a lot of uh, adjunct professors who've actually been out there practicing law for many, many years who come in on a part-time basis and teach practical courses. So I think that's one of the major changes. I'll give you an example. Today I was, uh, was my class in litigation skills. Seven o'clock this morning, I got there about a quarter of, and I had most of my students there. And so before class started, I asked them a question. I said, because I thought maybe this question might even come up today. I said, if they were all third year students, I said, if you could change one thing about the law school, what would you change? And one uh, young man said, I would eliminate the third year of academics and replace it with a year of uh, apprenticeship. And everybody jumped in and agreed with that which tells you a lot, tells you volumes, that they want to know how to practice law, not just the academics of law, the theory of law. And I think that's part of a reflection of the job market today. Uh, one of the great changes in our profession, when I say great, I'm necessarily mean good, but one of the big changes in our profession today is that jobs are much harder to come by these days, and the students are very aware of this. And so they want to know what it takes to become a lawyer right off you know, out of law school so you can become a valuable asset and be hired. And so I think that's uh, something that the practical aspect has been emphasized, but the students seem to want even a little bit more of it. And they seem to like the practical aspects. I get a lot of comments about litigation skills program, not just my class, but other faculty members. And they say this was the most valuable course they took because it helped them practice law when they got out of law school. Compared to when I went to law school, we didn't have these clinics we didn't have the tr this trial course, and we got immersed in the academia. But when I graduated from law school, I had no idea where the courthouse was. I had no idea how to begin to practice law. And it was from day one, I had to start all over, basically learning how to practice law. When you started law school, how many law schools were in Florida at that time? So we had Miami, Florida, and Florida State was on the horizon, not quite there. And I guess Stetson. And, and yes, I think that was it. And I think we're closer to 12 now. I don't know if you knew that. We're, we're approaching 12. May even. Unfortunately, have I do know that. Yeah. And that's that's not a good thing, in my right. humble opinion. I wanted to ask you about that. Um, why do you think that's not a good thing? Well, let me go back to my class this morning. I asked him. I said, "Well, okay, that's very interesting. You talk about having one year of apprenticeship along the lines of the of the model of the uh, medical schools." And they said, "Yes." I said, "Well, how are we going to accomplish that?" And one, one of the students suggested that Canada has a, a situation where they, they only graduate so many law students for so many jobs, and they can have this apprenticeship, uh, which I'm not sure we can accomplish. But I think part of the problem is this, uh, just this growth of uh, graduates. We were getting far more graduates than we can find jobs for. And apparently law schools are profit centers, and we not, not only have the traditional law schools here, but we've got several new schools that are just popping up all over the state, just churning out more and more graduates. Well, there aren't jobs for them. We may reach a crisis point here. And the reason I say that is because we're going to have a lot of lawyers, or lawyers to be, coming out, no jobs, and what are they going to do? Well, they're either going to go do something outside the law, which may be the better thing, or they're going to set their own sole practitioner practice without mentors without somebody to bounce things off, without the ability to have the, the background to understand what practicing law is about. It's not just 
taking depositions. It's not, just not closing a house sale. There's a lot more to it. And I'm afraid we're going to reach a crisis point where we're going to have a lot of problems with young lawyers who, not through no fault of their own, just don't have the mentoring, they don't have the role models, they don't have the expertise, the background to know what it is to practice law you know, at the right level. Is there anything that we can do to help uh, those students or those new lawyers coming in make their way? The answer is yes, but I'm not sure it's going to be enough. For example, you talk about mentoring. Mentoring has become a very in idea, and it's a wonderful idea. And one of the things I always tell lawyer, young lawyers and law students is find a mentor and be proactive about it because the potential mentors are very busy lawyers. They don't have time necessarily to go seek you out. So I always tell them, be proactive. Seek out somebody. If you're in a law firm, seek out somebody you think would be a good mentor for you. Don't wait for that person to come knocking on your door because she may be very busy with her clients and not even think about you. So that's the one thing. But how do we get enough mentors mentoring as many students as we have? I don't know the answer to that. I do know there's some really terrific programs out there. For example, one of my, fo my former partner, John Kozak, has the Minority Mentoring Program where his goal is, and his, he's been successful, in putting together a mentor, a seasoned, experienced lawyer or judge with a law student, a minority law student at the, every school in the state of Florida, all the major schools in Florida. A great program. He has a picnic every year, brings them all together. It's one of the most important, wonderful events I ever attend every year. I never miss it. But that's the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other people out there. I don't know where we're going to get all the mentors. But I'm, putting, I'm going to put the burden on the mentees to go out and seek to get the mentors. Because think about this. Uh, if a young lawyer comes to me and says, uh, Mr. Huck, when I was practicing law, you know, I, I think I'd like to have you help me out. You know, I need a mentor. Would you be willing to do that? Well, unless I'm a complete jerk about it, I'm going to be very uh, flattered by that person asking me to do that because it, it's saying something nice about me that he or she feels confident enough to, to come see me to mentor that person. That's what the, that's what the young person is going to have to do. He's going to have to reach out more and more. But I don't know if we're going to be able to do all... I don't think there's one mentor for ever, every mentee coming out of law school. I'm not, I'm not sure how we're going to accomplish that. I hate to be pessimistic about that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. We can all do our piece. And let me su suggest this to those people who are potential mentors. Every mentor I've ever talked to, every single one of them has said, you know, I didn't want to do this. I thought it was going to take... Not, some of them said I didn't want to do it. Most of them want to do it. But everyone, whether they wanted to do it or didn't want to do it, said, you know, it was one of the most rewarding, satisfying experiences I've ever had. I've had such a pleasure meeting with so-and-so occasionally to help that person along with his or her profession. It's been, it's been such a great experience. So those people who think it's a burden, think again. It's anything but a burden. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. It has been for me and I say for everybody I've talked to. Can you describe what your vision of being a good mentor is? I mean, how long is the relationship with the mentee? What kind of activities are they involved with? Well, in my experience, they run the gamut. Some of them are just conversations every week or so, maybe over a cup of coffee, telephone if they're out of town, things of that nature, while they're still in school. While they're practicing, it becomes a little more uh, intense, a little more uh, day, you know, hands-on uh, basis. Um, you want to meet with them? You know, take them to court. For example, one of the things I recommend to young lawyers who are working in firms, you don't get to court that often. It's frustrating. It's also going to inhibit your development as a professional if you don't go to court. But you're busy billing your hours. Again, be proactive. Go out and see the partner who's got a trial or an important hearing. Ask that partner to take you along and tell them, hey, I'm not going to bill the client for this time. I look at this. I just want to see how you do it. Those are the kind of things. And the lawyers should invite the younger lawyers to come with them, even though it may not be a billing experience. Because that's how you develop good lawyers to come up behind you and develop your law firm and keep your, your law firm going and being prosperous. So those are the kind of things you, you need to do. Uh, and meet with them. Talk, sit down and talk to them. You know, they, they've got lots of questions. There are no bad questions for young lawyers. Uh, and I think that's another thing that they could do. I know we're all busy. And lawyers think they're too busy to, some think they're too busy to stop and spend some time with the young lawyers. 
but as I say, it's, it's the most valuable thing you can do for your young lawyers, and it's very rewarding and very satisfying. We've talked a lot about the challenges that are facing the profession right now. Obviously, we have a lot of lawyers coming in. Is there anything that you see that we as a profession are doing well? Oh, yes. Um, Florida Bar, I think, has some great programs. I really do. Um, the CLE, continually education courses, some great courses. And I've been involved in some of them. I've attended some of them as, as an attendee. I think that's very strange. I think the uh, Florida Bar and the members of the Bar do a pretty good job of mentoring, as I say. Uh, where we seem to be uh, fail, I guess, is, uh, and I don't know why, our public image. Uh, it, it, it just boggles my mind uh, that we haven't been able to improve our public image with you know, most people because we know what we're doing, but we don't seem to get the message out. And yet I see the, the Florida Bar putting out all kinds of good information, all kinds of good promotions, but for some reason they're just not taking. But I think they do a pretty good job in that respect. Um, I think that's probably the area that we're, we're doing the best job in, in educating ourselves as we continue to practice things of that nature. Let me ask you, um, at some point in your career, I assume you decided that you would like to be a judge. Is that a correct statement? Not accurate, actually. Tell, uh, tell us I, I think my story is a little different than the typical story. I think maybe in the back of my mind, all trial lawyers say, well, maybe someday I'd want to be a judge. But that was not something that I had my sights on. It really, it really wasn't. Um, and I probably would not have been a judge had it not been for a telephone call I got from a friend of mine from law school, who I've known since law school, who was on the commission and invited me to apply. And um, I told him, well, I like being a lawyer. I like my law partners. I've been very, very lucky. I've had terrific law partners throughout my career. I've had a good, I really enjoy the practice of law. And I said, I really kind of like what I'm doing. Thank you very much. The next day I got a call from another member of the statewide commission who said, I understand you got a call from so-and-so, and I really think you ought to think about it. At the time, I was almost 60 years old. I've been practicing law 35 years. The second call got me thinking even more about it. I said, you know, maybe, maybe there's something to this. Maybe, because two people call me, maybe I am qualified to be a judge, because I wasn't sure I could be a federal judge. I really wasn't sure that I was up to the, to the measure. And the reason was because when I think of a federal judge, I think of Peter Fay, I think of Bill Hoover, I think of Stanley Marcus. And they set the bar very, very high. And so I went and thought about it. And I finally came to realize that you didn't have to be one of those superstars to be a good federal judge. So then I put my application in. But it was, I couldn't have done it unless I convinced myself that I didn't have to measure up to the gold standards that those three and people like them had set. And I'm extremely happy that I made that decision. Tell me what about those judges in your mind gives, makes them the gold standard? Well, first of all, they're extremely intelligent and competent. Let's just set that aside for a moment. What sets them apart? They're really, really good people. They care very much about their jobs. Take Judge Hoover, for example. There are so many awards around the state named after him. There's one at the University of Miami, the Florida Bar, because he's the type of person that, that exemplifies what a judge should be, for example. He's not only intelligent, he's extremely wise. He's got patience of Job. He will listen to the end of your argument without interruption, but very patient. And you know when you've heard he's finished his hearing, you know you've been given a fair hearing. And he'll be very impartial about it. Just like when he was a, a trial lawyer. He was a great trial lawyer. People don't know that. Many younger people don't know that. He was one of the best trial lawyers in Dade County. But always the gentleman and the gentleman. And he's a good example of how you can be a great, effective trial lawyer and still be a gentleman in doing so. And if he's carried that over to his, uh, his, his being a judge. Same thing with, with Judge Fay. I talk to anybody about these people. They, they just have, they, they love the profession. They love lawyers. They love what they do. They expect the most out of you. They won't accept anything less. But as a lawyer, you don't want to give them anything less. Nobody 
Nobody will walk into Bill Hoover's courtroom and be unprofessional. Nobody will walk into the chambers where Judge Fay is sitting on the 11th Circuit and be uncivil, unprofessional. It's because of their example, you want to show them that you're as good as you can be. And it's just the way it is. And they're, they're just those kinds of people. Same thing with Judge Marcus. You know, he was a trial judge. My son clerked for him. When uh, my son called me one day and said, Judge, I'm, I mean, Dad, I wasn't a judge at the time. He said, Dad, what do you think about federal clerkship? I said, I think that's a great way to start your practice. You know, you'll get to see how it works from the inside. He said, well, where, where should I apply? I told him, three judges. Judge Faye, Judge Hoover, Judge Marcus. Because those are the three judges I thought were they're going to be the best teachers, the best mentors for my son. And those are, those are, those are the people that you, you want to emulate. And again, I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm not as patient as Judge Hoover. I'm not as wise as Judge Hoover. Uh, but when I went on the bench, I went out to Judge Hoover. And I said, you know, uh, Judge Hoover, um, I'm going to go on the bench in a couple of weeks. What, what's the best advice you could give me as a young judge? Not a young judge, but a new judge. Uh, and he turned to me and said, Paul, be kind to the lawyers. Be kind to the lawyers. That's the way he is. He's kind to the lawyers. He demands the, the, you know, that you do it right. He demands competence, but he... He's kind to you. He's understanding. Um, same thing with Judge Faye. Same thing with Judge Marcus. And, and there are others like that. Those happen to be the three that I know and really admire. They're kind of the role models. As a matter of fact, the first day I went on the bench, you know those little post-its, those yellow post-its? I took a pencil and I wrote down four letters. H-O-E-V. The first four letters in Judge Hoover's name. And I stuck that sticker on my bench to remind me of what he said and, and what I should strive to be what I should aspire to be. I never would ever suggest that I'm going to be anywhere close to Judge Hoover or Judge Fay or Judge Marcus. But that little post it's still there. It's a little wrinkle and a little, you know, not at the end, but I still have it there because when I get in a situation where I think I'm not as patient as I should be or just not as whatever you need, you know, not as uh, accepting of what the lawyers have to say at that time, I look over this thing and say, okay, what would Judge Hoover do? And it kind of calms me down a little bit and puts me back into perspective. So, so these people still tend to be mentors and role models. What do you think has been your greatest challenge going from being a trial lawyer to being a, a judge? And this is going to be kind of an odd answer. I don't think there's been a great challenge. Uh, I had no experience in the criminal side. But when I went on the bench, and I was a little nervous about that, I'd never seen a criminal trial. But I found, when I went out there the very first day, first trial was a criminal trial, I remember standing at the doorway with a file in my hand thinking to myself, Paul, what in the world are you doing here? Took a deep breath and walked out there. And it was fine because the lawyers helped me along. You know, they didn't try to play games with me. They realized I was a new judge and it was, it was a pleasure to have them try the case and to be able to try the case with them. It, it's, you know, I've gotten so much help along the way that it hasn't been a big challenge. Once in a while, you know, I'll see a lawyer doing something and say, you know, I wouldn't do it that way. Or I might say, well, I'd like to get down there in the pits maybe a little bit and, and get involved in it. But for the most part, you know, I've had 36 years of trying cases. I was, I think it was time to move on. So I, there wasn't any great challenge. The only thing that's really different is we're a bit isolated, particularly on the federal bench. We don't run for office. So sometimes we get isolated from the rest of uh, the profession and society. So I think it's important we have to keep that in mind that we're not to isolate ourselves too much. We've got to realize what our jobs are. We're really there as servants of the profession, of the courts, of the people. Sometimes that's hard to keep in mind because it's, uh, you know, we're, we have appointments for life. And you know, people take pretty good care of us. And they, as my wife says, why did you become a, a judge? And he says, you, you work harder. This is when I was, before I became a senior judge. You work harder, you make less money, Oh, I see. They stand up when you walk in the room. And then you get part of that. You know, the, the, the judge-itis, they call it, I think. Uh, and we've got to be careful about that. I think that's probably the biggest challenge, not to have the judge-itis. Particularly, I think, it's federal judge. So we should get out more, go to more uh, events involving lawyers, uh, receptions, speak at luncheons. See what the lawyers are thinking about. I speak at a number of luncheons, and I almost never prepare a speech. What I do, I always tell the person, I say, I don't want to 
give remarks. I want to see what the lawyers have on their mind. So I, ha I want to have a give and take. So I want to take questions. Because in asking the questions to me, I'm understanding and finding out what the lawyers have in their minds, what's on their minds, what's bothering them about me or other judges. So I think it's very educational for me, more so than even for, for the lawyers out there, even though they may not realize that when they're asking those questions. What do you love about being a judge? Uh, that's hard to, I guess that's hard to say. I, I, I do love being a judge. I really, it's a wonderful job. And I'm, I'm amazed that I didn't jump on the idea when I got that first phone call right away. It's, um, when I was practicing law, I said I was a workaholic. When I first was a young lawyer, I, I was involved in a lot of bar activities, various boards, you know, state board, local board. Uh, did a lot of going out to schools and, and speaking to kids, this, that, and the other. And then after about, after I became a senior lawyer, no longer a young lawyer, I guess that's at age 36, something right. like that, I seem to have gotten more caught up as a, as a workaholic in spending all my time practicing law. And about the time I became a judge, and maybe it was because I became a judge, uh, the light bulb went off. I looked around, I saw some people I really admired, and they seemed to enjoy their practice so much. People like Bob Josephsberg, John Kozak. Uh, my son, who's a young lawyer, seemed to get something out of, of the practice law that I wasn't getting out. And I realized what it was. It was, it was uh, I wasn't doing the public service that I had done when I was a young lawyer. Uh, it, was, it was basically me and my practice, even though I enjoyed practicing. I, I was missing out on something. And I came to realize that was what was missing. Giving back. And I look at the, the judgeship as a way of giving back. It's, it is, in a way, a very important public service. Uh, I think one of the things I can do that I as a judge now that I couldn't do as a lawyer, and not because of me or any qualities I have, but because of the position itself. I can do things and affect lives that I couldn't otherwise affect. And I've become very aware of that. And it's interesting, several other judges said the exact same thing to me. Uh, it wasn't too long ago, uh, one of the judges approached me. Uh, she was kind of drawn into a very important project involving uh, high school kids, uh, inner city high school kids in a, in a law program, and she said, she invited me to come for a luncheon one day to talk with them. And as I was leaving, she said, I said, Paul, I said, you know, I've never done anything like this before. They kind of duped me into doing this. I've been now doing it for two years. I've never enjoyed anything more in my life. I've never had anything more satisfying than this in my life. And that's, and that's what it's all about when it's said and done. And I guess, unfortunately, some of this perspective comes from age. You know, I'm 72 now. I didn't have this perspective when I was 32 or 42 or 52 even. Uh, it's, if I could do one thing, I'd like to be able to take the perspective that some of us with gray hair have and give it to younger people. Because those, you'll realize there are certain things that are more important than the financial rewards you get out of the practice of law. I knew that now. There was a time when I didn't know it. I'm much happier, much more satisfied now having known that. And like I said, I get more satisfaction out of doing these other things, you know, trying to help people from the platform as a judge than I ever got as a trial lawyer, or making a lot of money, or, uh, winning cases, getting the accolades of winning cases, things like that. So if, that was, if I could transplant that thought to the young lawyers, I would love to do it, because I think it's so important. Obviously, you mentioned earlier that your son is a lawyer. Yes. And uh, did you encourage him to become a lawyer, or did he find his own way? He found his own way. He went, he went to school, and he was, uh, I guess, a sophomore, and he said, Dad, I'm going to declare as a history major with a minor in international studies. So my response was, and then what are you going to do? <laughs> and he said, well, Dad, I think I want to go to law school. That's the first time he'd ever mentioned it. We never discussed it. I had thought he was going to go to medical school because his mother had pretty much planned that out for him. And uh, I remember taking him to the, to the airport one day, and he said, she said, well, now, Paul, you should make sure you take the right courses, biology or whatever, for uh, pre-med. And he turned to her. I don't forget this. He says, Mom, I have no desire to be in the medical field. Or the medical services is what he said. He didn't even say be a doctor or, or you know, medical field, in the medical services. So it was a bit of a surprise, and I was, frankly, fright, quite flattered when he said to me that he was wanted to be a lawyer. And a very fine young lawyer. And he, you know, he's the mold of, of Joseph Berg and, and John Kozak, the people who do the extra things. Not only are they great professional lawyers, but they give back so much. Give me an example of 
why Bob Joseph Spurg um, is such a, is such a pillar in that type of uh, discussion. Why? What about him in particular? Uh, that what does he do that makes people think this is someone who gives back? What does he do? Well, you've said it correctly. He is a pillar. He is the pillar of professionalism, I think, certainly here in South Florida. And there are others all over, but he is, he is certainly one has been, since I've known him, he's just a few years older than I am. We were young lawyers together. He's always been this way. He's always been the ultimate professional. He's always been the person expecting the most out of you, the civility, the professionalism out of you. First of all, he's an excellent lawyer in the sense that he represents his clients extremely well. He's an extremely competent, effective lawyer. Everybody knows that. But he carries it to the next level. He is so civil, so professional, and it's, it's, to him it's so important that we all are professionals, we all treat each other civilly, that he's out there beating that drum all the time. He cares about people. He cares about our profession. He loves his profession. He loves being, he loves being a lawyer. He just, he's somebody who really, really enjoys being a lawyer. He works hard at it, but it's not work for him. It's, it's pure pleasure. And he's fun to be around because of that. You know, he's always positive about being a lawyer. And if uh, people in society in general all knew Bob Joseph Berg, there would be no bad lawyer jokes because he exemplifies what lawyers should be. And what motivates him? I don't know. I, I can't reach into his mind. But I see what I see, and he's always been that way since he was a young lawyer like you were, a young lawyer. Um, he just, it's something, I guess it's a DNA. But he, he's impacted literally hundreds, maybe thousands of young lawyers with his example. You know, he's a mentor by nature. And he's also a role model. By that I mean there's a difference between mentoring and being a role model. You don't have to have hands-on you know, contact. You can just be out there and people say, that's what I want to be. And he's a role model for a lot of people. We have some very, very fine role models in our profession. If you had the ability to give some advice that would would definitely be taken. There's no question about whether that advice would be taken and followed. What would your advice be to a new lawyer coming into the profession? How much time do we have left? As much as you want. Well, let me go through a few things. Let me give you a story and tell you what I think is the most important advice I would give to a lawyer. Two of my best friends from high school and our wives were having dinner in Cashiers, North Carolina two years ago, summer. And we were having a nice conversation. As we were leaving, this young man comes rushing up and he apologizes. I, I apologize for, for us interrupting you, but my wife and I are celebrating our second wedding anniversary. And we were sitting at the table next to you and we were overhearing your conversation and we thought we might, you might be lawyers. I said, well, one, one person was a lawyer, very prominent, excellent lawyer here in Miami, great reputation. The other fellow is in business, very competitive business, very successful businessman and a judge. And we explained this to him. He said, well, well, my wife suggested, since you might be involved in the law, that I'm, I'm going to start my own practice as a sole practitioner in a small town just on the other side of the border in South Carolina. And she said, you ought to go ask these people, these gentlemen, what advice they would give to you as a young lawyer. So he said, here I am. And by the way, it's good advice to seek advice from lawyers. Another good piece of advice for husbands is to take the advice of your wife like he did. <laughs> but anyway, he said, what is the single most important thing that you would give me as the best advice that you can as a young lawyer starting out on his own. And it was really amazing. Immediately and unanimously, we all said the exact same thing. Your reputation. You've got to have a sterling reputation at all costs. It's going to make your life a lot more pleasant. You'll be successful in what you do. The people that, you, the peers that will respect you. You'll, get, you'll be a good lawyer. And most important of all, you'll be a happy lawyer. And if you don't have a good reputation, it won't be pretty. That was the best advice. And it was, it was very interesting because we all had the exact same thing at the exact same time. Uh, the second thing we told him was, get a good mentor, particularly if you're going to be practicing on your own. So that's some of the advice I would give. Uh, the other advice, um, there's an old Chinese proverb. It goes something like this. Um, in fact, I think it goes exactly like this. Laws control the lesser man. Moral conduct control the greater one. Applying that to lawyers, um, you should strive to be 
not the lesser man or the lesser lawyer, but the greater lawyer. In other words, don't do the minimum. Don't comply just with the rules of professional responsibility, the ethics as it's now thought now, but comply and be a professional as uh, that term is generally used. That is, I think it's really ethics in the old sense, the historical sense, the, the sense of Socrates seeking the ideal man or the ideal woman. Uh, you know, integrity, honesty, civility, good deeds, great competence, those kind of things. So you should strive not to be the lesser lawyer, but the greater lawyer. And you will have a successful practice, and you have more important, successful, enjoyable life. No, I say you, you just can't put into words what it was like to be mentored by somebody like Peter Fay, to be to go to court with somebody like Judge Hoover, or to try cases against Judge Hoover. Uh, you just can't do justice to that because you had to be there. You had to experience just what wonderful lawyers these people are. I mean, you know, they they they're officers of the court. They they hold that honor so high. Judge Fay is always talking about being not only representing your client diligently and competently, but being an officer of the court. It's so important to these people. And I hope some of that's rubbed off on me and, and others who've had the experience of, of uh, being able to have the, the wonderful experience of, of dealing with these people. Both he, uh, I was on the other side of cases with Judge Hoover when he was a lawyer. And there's nobody that you could have asked for to be a better person on the other side, except he was so good that, that uh, it was very difficult to win a case against him. But uh, just... You just can't put it in words the, the, the impact these people have had on a lot of young lives, and still do. It's, you know, I, um, it's just I sit here to kind of almost get chills thinking of, of some of the experiences I've had with these these people. They're just such an impact on on my life and others. That they're all out there. They're really out practicing law, judges, whatever. The only other thing I would say maybe about uh, the profession is that we have to realize that as professionals, as lawyers, we have a special responsibility. The preamble to the um, rules of professional conduct talk about our responsibilities. And first of it's to the client, of course. The second one is to the uh, legal system, off the office of the court that Judge uh, Fay is always talking about. And the third is our responsibility as public officials uh, who have a special responsibility to society in general. And I, sometimes I think we forget that responsibility. Uh, there was a, um, a legal writer or philosopher, his name is Lee Shulman. Uh, he's with the Carnegie Foundation. And he put it very succinctly. Uh, he described it as a trusteeship. We as lawyers have enormous power. Enormous power. Um, we have a monopoly on the practice of law, right? Uh, we have power over Literally, life, liberty, happiness, and property rights. Only we as lawyers have that right. But we have responsibilities to go along with that. And, and Schumann uh, had a very interesting and very pithy quote about that. I think it goes something like, um, what he was doing was just positioning the rights that we have with the responsibilities that we have. And it goes something like, autonomy, responsibility. Work, integrity. What he means by that is, as the profession, the law profession, unlike other professions, we're self-regulating. It's our responsibility to make sure we regulate ourselves properly. So that's that we have the right to self-regulate ourselves. That's unique. Concurrent with that is the obligation, though, to do that properly. To that the ends of our judicial system, our legal system meet the goals of society. What does he mean by the work? Well, we have the sole right to practice law. But concurrent with that is the obligation to do it with integrity. Sometimes, some of us understand the rights, but we don't understand or accept the responsibilities. And he described that as, that's the deal. That's how he described it, that's the deal. Uh, and when I teach you know, at the school I talk to students about, that's the deal. Uh, and it's, I think, very important that we understand there are two sides. Like every contract, there are two sides to the deal, two sides to the social contract. And I think that's a very, I think that's a very uh, apt way to uh, describe what that social contract is, that trusteeship that we hold as lawyers. And we're all parties to that, that deal. 
we're all trustees in that trusteeship. So let's, let's not forget that. Well, I want to thank you very, very much for um, spending time with us today and sharing these thoughts. Um, it, it means a lot. Well, thank you. I appreciate thank the you. opportunity. Our pleasure. Thank you, sir.